from Thomas Edison State University. This is Edison Soundstage. Find yourself at a crossroads in your career? Welcome to the Career Studio on Edison Soundstage. Listen as we talk with professionals from a range of industries where they offer expert insights and resources to guide you through career transitions, changes, and opportunities toward the next phase of your career. I'm Cielo Callahan. I'm the Director of Career Development, and on with us today is Caitlin Heyman. Caitlin, do you want to just give a quick intro? Sure. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Caitlin Heyman. I'm a recruiting manager with Robert Half Finance and Accounting. Uh, I cover our Central Jersey locations. I've been with Robert Half just over eight years, both working in our uh, finance and accounting team, as well as administrative and customer support. Prior to Robert Half, I was working in financial services for about 10 years. I'm a local girl from New Jersey, uh, just moved over to Bucks County across the bridge, but still nice and local to everybody in Mercer County. And with that, we're going to go dive in. So the first thing I like to mention to people is there's a difference between flexibility and being unfocused. So what I recommend is flexibility and focus. So it is always good to have a job target or targets in mind. I think that two or three things and you can do a good quality job search. But if you're staying flexible because you don't want to key in on any area, it's going to be really hard for you to do an effective job search. You have to kind of know where you're going to direct your search. And if you're not quite sure where you're going, the Career One Stop, which is put out by the Department of Labor, is an excellent resource for you. It takes you through self-assessments. You can research career fields. They even then will link you to different job search methods as well. Um, so I strongly recommend that you consider using that particular site. Um, Kayla, can you just real quick reinforce from, a, from your perspective, the idea of focus versus flexibility? Absolutely. I think that there needs to be the perfect balance because if you're not honing in on what's important to you, whether it's a handful of skills or a particular industry, it's a wide, wide world out there. So, you know, I would also recommend trying to steer away a bit from maybe a job title and really honing in on the different skills and things that you're looking for in a particular opportunity in order to gear your job search that way. All right, so one of the methods that we really key in on is networking. Um, we key on, in on it so much that I do an actual session specifically on networking. So we're not going to get into that much depth tonight, but we are going to talk about this because we know that in the, United, in the United States, somewhere between 45 and 85 percent of the jobs, depending upon who's reporting the statistics, are gotten through contacts. So what I usually say is count on at least half the jobs going through contacts, okay? And the reason for that from an employer's perspective is having somebody they trust refer somebody gives them a higher level of trust. One of the things we're gonna talk about at the end is third-party recruiters like Caitlin's organization, and they become their trusted partner too. It's a little bit, third-party recruiting is somewhat of a networking tool as well um, in that they're actually going to advocate for you um, and they have the trust of the employers. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. 100%. I think, uh, you know, anybody can check boxes as far as the skills, but being able to be a connector and a networker, uh, I think is only going to help. It's never going to hinder in a job search. So then we start off with our own personal network, at letting everybody you know, know you're looking, what you're looking for, what your parameters are. Um, you'd be surprised sometimes the connections people have. Um, and, you know, they are often because the people you know personally are invested in you. They're the first people who are willing to go out and advocate for you. So do not underestimate your personal network. But then you do want to start to expand out to people who are in your field of interest. One of my favorite ways to do that is through professional associations. Just about every field has a trade or professional association. Um, and within them, when you find the right one, national, regional, um, even statewide, and sometimes you may be, you may find that it's good to join all three of those, a, a statewide, a regional, and a national. Um, you will find that they can be an excellent resource for your job search. Plus, once you join, you can typically get into, get the membership list, and now you know where you can reach out to people of like interests with you. And if you join as a student, oftentimes employers, or even within about your first year after graduation, oftentimes, not employers, 
professional associations will either waive or reduce your membership fee. So I strongly urge you to get involved in a professional association. You know, my association also has a job search feature and oftentimes people in our field will post there first. So oftentimes people think of the big job boards as being one of their better resources when actually those big job boards may be missing a lot of the things that are in your individual field. Just as Caitlin was mentioning what she specializes in, having you know, a specialized avenue um, like a professional association from an employer's perspective is gonna yield the proper audience. You know, when we do conduct searches, and I've been involved in a lot of searches from my own perspective as well, you'd be surprised how many unqualified people will respond for a job too. And from an employer's perspective, being able to weed out some of those by going through a professional association that's really gonna attract the people who you are looking for is a great bet. I also think alumni. One of the ways to identify alumni, uh, we are trying to build an alumni network, but we don't have that up and really working right yet. Um, but this is where LinkedIn does come in handy. If you go to the Thomas Edison page in LinkedIn, you'll see about midway through, you can click on alumni and it will give you that there is something, I think it's 40 something thousand alumni that are on LinkedIn. And then you can narrow that down by field and then you can reach out to those people. One tip I have whenever you're using LinkedIn and you're trying to connect with somebody, don't just hit the connect button, send them a note, introduce yourself, explain that you're TESU alumnus or a uh, TES stu TESU student. And more than likely having that connection, they're more likely to, to connect with you than they would having that thing in common, I should say. They're more likely to connect with you than they would if you um, just asked for a connection without any explanation as to why. I'm just gonna give that a little more light. I think that adding those little notes goes a long way. And if you're you know, playing around LinkedIn too, it also shows you those secondary connections. So I would say also keep that in mind on the flip side, if there is a contact or a company that you're going after, it'll show you the things that you have in common and you can almost work it backwards a little bit too. But just to mirror what you said, I think those little notes go a long way. I mean, people get flooded with new connections all day. So if you can do something to set yourself apart, even if it's something is, you know, two sentences long, it doesn't need to be anything fancy, but I think that goes a long way. I agree. What people don't realize is um, as you become more established, you also get hit up through LinkedIn with people who want to connect with you to sell their products and things too. So people are a little skeptical of just accepting connections. So an introduction really does help. In echoing, when I talk about social media, obviously LinkedIn is a very important source. And sometimes people are like, really, does it matter? I think in a lot of cases, you have to have a LinkedIn profile when people start to check you out, okay? Because it's considered kind of a a professional basic anymore. They're not the only um, game in town, but they are the most popular. So I would suggest if you're gonna look at any of the others that are out there, you also consider having a LinkedIn. But I will say this, if you are gonna have a LinkedIn profile, keep it up to date. There's really probably nothing worse than having just your name um, and maybe a, a title on there. If there's nothing of substance in there, you might as well not have a LinkedIn because it almost reflects worse on you. And I do another whole session just on LinkedIn profiles. So feel free um, if you're not sure how to develop your LinkedIn profile to attend that session as well. Make sure it also reflects what you have on your resume as well. You know, sometimes people might keep off if they had, you know, a job unrelated to their current field from 15 years ago, which is fine, but make sure whatever's reflected on your resume also matches your LinkedIn. I look at my LinkedIn profile as being a compliment to my resume. Not mm -hmm. necessarily a repeat, because some people be like, well, can't I just cut and paste in? And you can. I just think it also gives you an opportunity to do some interpreting of your background for the yes. in a different way. Yeah, absolutely. I also think in terms of social media, and I think this is one of the things Caitlin was also referring to, is say you have a target company. You can find their page. And just as I was mentioning with the Thomas Edison page, you can find a link to the alumni. In their page, you can find a link to the people they have who are on LinkedIn. And then you can look for somebody in the job titles that you're looking for or the management titles above that and try to connect with them too. I think sometimes people avoid LinkedIn because it is kind of a massive thing if you're not sure how to use it. Just get yourself comfortable with that. Um, like I said, that workshop will help you figure out how to do that.
networking is important for the referrals part of it. You don't typically want to ask somebody, do they have a job or do they know of jobs? But if you build a relationship with them, they will typically, if they get to know you and find that they think you are a quality person, they're going to look out for you and they are going to make those referrals. Mm -hmm. If you are, um, if you have a referral, if somebody has said to you, you know, go ahead and use my name. If they're not submitting your application for you, what I usually do is in my cover letter, the first line of my cover letter starts off with Evelyn Davis suggested, Davila suggested that I contact you regarding X position. Because if they're going to know her name, chances are I'm going to get at least a courtesy interview out of that. And once I get my foot in the door, then it's up to me. And really, that's what your contacts can do for you, is they can just get that foot in the door for you. It's very rare that they can actually get you the job. Now, if they're the CEO of the company and they tell somebody, oh, think about this person, probably you're going to get the job. But beyond that, they can at least get you hopefully in the door to get the interview. And I would also say that remember that those relationships are are for the, the long haul, right? You know, if you don't get that referral on the first conversation, don't get discouraged. You know, continue the follow-ups and the touches here and there. And on the flip side, you never know. They might be coming to you if they see that you have an opposite connection too. So it's always that little give to get also. But I think so many times people think they're going to go to a networking event and walk out with you know, all these referrals. And sometimes that's the case and majority of the time it's not. So just to remember, don't get discouraged. I think networking is something it's a, it takes time, right? To build that trust and relationship too. And it may not be for this job search, maybe two, three, five years from now, you decide you're looking for a new position. If you've kept in touch with those people, they may be, um, they may know of something then. Alyssa, you have a question. Yeah, I think, you know, it was just more of a comment to add on to the whole networking piece. Like for me personally, I love networking at, you know, social events, personal events, professional events, but I just find when you go into it with no like agenda or ulterior motive and you're just there to genuinely connect with people, like networking and relationships, it's really a long game. Like if you go in not expecting anything and then later down the line, something comes of it. Like for me, I think of that's a bonus, but like if you go in with kind of that expectation, I think that that's where people can end up being disappointed. Yeah. When people say work the room, the suggestion yeah. is not that you go in there saying, I'm going to walk out of there with five job openings. Right. It's really more that you get to know every person in the room. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. But that's that's really a great comment, Alyssa. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you. All right. Um, and as I said, I do a whole session on networking. So if, if you're one of those people, and trust me, when I was starting out, I was one of those people who the concept of networking just seemed so overwhelming. Go ahead and attend the whole networking session. We'll talk that through. You know, we come up with, I'll teach you how to do informational interviewing, how to develop, uh, kind of, you know, develop those relationships, do career check-ins with people um, and recognize that, yeah, it is a long game. So the next thing I find that people tend to use is direct contact. And I include in those direct contacts, um, mass job boards. I think that's probably where most people start their job search today as they go to Indeed or LinkedIn or one of the other job boards that are out there. The challenge that I find with these job boards is one, they're not always up to date. So sometimes you go in there and you see this job that you think is absolutely wonderful and exciting and you feel perfect for, and then nothing ever happens. Well, it may not have even really been open. So the first thing that I do is my, my personal take is if somebody isn't going to identify who the employer is, I'm going to proceed a little bit more cautiously. But if they have identified the employer, I go to the employer site, look at their job pages, see if the position is posted through there. And if it's in there, my cover letter I will reference that I found it in LinkedIn or Indeed, but I'm actually going to apply through the employer site and not through the third party site. The reason being that you have to make it through two AI if you're going through a third party site. You have to make it through Indeeds or LinkedIn's and then you have to make it through the employers. I'd rather take my chances with one, <laughs> personally. Um, plus, I know I'm in that employer system, okay, if I apply directly through their system. If it's not on their site, it's probably not still open. Um, and sometimes it's the employer didn't take it down, and sometimes it's that some of these jobs attract more people, and the third-party sites will sometimes keep them up a little longer. 
And by third parties here, I'm talking not about third party recruiters, I'm talking about the job board. So I tend to go to the employer hiring site. Now, if there's a job that I think is really perfect for me, just keep in mind, just like I said before, proceed with caution in that if you really like that job that you found on LinkedIn or whomever, but they didn't identify exactly who the employer is, go ahead and apply, just be cautious. One, anytime you're applying, you do not send personal information beyond how to contact you. Anybody is asking you for banking information, Evelyn, I see your hand and we'll be with you in just one second, or anything else, it is probably not legitimate. Because the other thing you do have to be cautious about right now is there are a lot of job scams running today. Most popular is, oh, we're going to hire you. We're going to send you some money to buy all the equipment that you need. Then they send you a check for more money than um, you actually were supposed to get. Then they say, oh, okay, just buy what you need and then send us back the difference. And then the check never clears and you're out the money. And you bought the equipment. Most popular is, oh, we're going to hire you. We're going to send you some money to buy all the equipment that you need. Then they send you a check for more money than um, you actually were supposed to get. Then they say, oh, okay, just buy what you need and then send us back the difference. And then the check never clears and you're out the money. And you bought the equipment. Uh, I will find the job on LinkedIn you know, go to my resume, make some tweaks to it or whatever, go to the job site and it's not available. So that's a great point to always go to the job site first. That's all. It's happened enough times. Yes, yeah. <laughs> that I wanted to share. And then Alyssa? Yes. And, and then Alyssa? A little bit more about these scams. How would they present themselves? Because typically I do end up going to the mass job boards like, uh, you know, LinkedIn and Indeed, et cetera. So where did these scams present themselves? Would it be in emails or like how should we look out for them and be vigilant at them? I am always a little bit uh, skeptical if a recruiter has a um, asked you to apply using a Gmail address and not a corporate address. Okay, sure. Yeah. Not even a upload your resume here. I definitely yeah. am very cautious about those. Keep in mind that you were not hired until you complete an I-9 or W-4 form. If people are not, and I should say I-9 and W-4 form, if people are not onboarding you into a system, I would not be revealing any information from them. Somebody told me today that they had a person who um, just got scammed out of a lot of money through a job um, uh, scam. It was not the same one. Mm. I'm trying to remember the particulars. If I remember it, I will tell you guys. To just proceed cautiously, if they're not identifying who the employer is and you can't research them, if yeah, you're sure. talking to them, once you start to talk to them, like even, Caitlin, you guys don't always to help a candidate initially who the employer is, correctly? Correct. Correct. Right. Yeah. And, and that sometimes just boils down to maybe confidentiality of the role, but right, you know, sure. to your point too, as far as those, you know, the conversations are very transparent. But even when we're placing individuals, whether it be through our consultant division or permanent placement division, all of those I-9s, W-4s, even background checks, there are so many rules and regulations that need to talk about privacy. And I, I'll use myself as an example. I don't have access to people's social security numbers. It's somebody way up high in corporate. So even if somebody needs a copy of a form, we're jumping through hoops. So, you know, to Seal's point, right, if somebody's picking up the phone and saying, hey, I need XYZ or fill out this PDF and email it to me, that's what I might pump the brakes, right? Because there's so many, so many hoops that employers have to jump through around that privacy piece that sure. it's all going to go through those different portals. It might look different company yeah. to company, but there will always be a process in place. Yeah, yeah and, and that's what I was just gonna say before as well, is like even LinkedIn, you know, promotes being private and careful with your information. Like it all comes back to that. Like if you go on your LinkedIn profile into your settings, there's so many different privacy settings that you can choose to protect yourself from this scenario, exactly. Right. I did remember it, Angela, I see your hand. We're gonna to go to you in just one second. I did remember what the scam was. This one, they started okay. asking for the banking information. They said that they don't, um, actually in this particular case, they said they don't do electronic checks. They only send hard checks and they would send it weekly. And mm -hmm. there was no, didn't seem to be a process that I would run for the hills from. You know, I mean, yeah. employers have to document all of this you know, if nothing else for, for tax purposes. Right. Yeah. So, so if they're not doing that, they're not legitimate. And then the other thing is trust your gut when it comes to scams. If it's exactly. too good to be true, it's probably. And it is. True. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>
can't yeah. tell you how many times I've seen somebody advertise. I think the other scam I see constantly is we're going to pay you $300 to do, to work $300 per day to do one hour's worth of work three times a week. And the work is going to be that you're going to open our email and you're going to run to Walmart. And it's always Walmart. More than likely, it's an out of the country scam. And the only store they know in the United States is Walmart. <laughs> so they have you running to Walmart, supposedly. If you think about it, $300 an hour would mean that you are making like $270,000 a year if you were working full time. Is somebody really going to pay you $300 an hour? To run to Walmart. Right, to run to Walmart and open open some emails. It would be nice. Right. (laughs) (laughs) You can sign me up for that today. Yes. (laughs) So, you know, if it sounds too good to be true, it's too good to be true. The other one I've seen is, would you walk my dog for $500 a week? Unless you are, you know, I have a dog. I love to walk my dog. Unless they're walking your dog for eight hours a day, basically, five hundred dollars a week is a lot of money for dog walking. Um, if it sounds too good to be true, it's it's too good to be true. Angela, I know you had a question, or did we answer your question? Uh, no, I still have a question. Okay, I don't know if you're going to touch on it, but um, with the new technology of bots, I've noticed when applying for some things, like I followed your advice about. See it on the board, check the company to see if they still have it. If the job's not there, it's it's dead. But I've noticed um, sometimes I start applying for something and then these bots will just come up and, hey, I'm here to help you. And I can tell that it's not a real person, but they're asking me for information while I'm trying to apply for the job. And I feel like it's it, 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 it makes, makes me hesitate. It makes me feel uncomfortable because it's like, first of all, is this really connected with this? Because there have been um, instances where there's phishing, where it seems like you're on the right site, but you're really not. And so it's asking me my name, address, these, all these things I would have to fill out to apply anyway. But at the same time, how do I really know that this is connected with this company? And I'm not just giving my information to somebody else. I, I usually stop after, you know, yeah. I haven't done it yet, but it just, yeah. I, I understand recruiters are using this technology, but at the same time, how do we know who's yeah. legit and who's not with this? Yeah. Well, one of the first things is I always suggest that you check the email, not the, not the email, the web address, and make sure that when you clicked on the link, it actually took you to an employer site. Um, and what I would do is actually go to the employer, do a separate search for the employer so I can see how their, their web address is worded. Because you and I know that some, the, the better tricksters are the ones who are going to be like one letter off. Mm-hmm. Um, so make sure that the first part of the, the web address matches. If it doesn't, you're probably in a third party site that is doing something. And again, we use the third party term as a wide, broad thing, but um, you're in a site that is probably not acting at, for that employer. And even um, just to take that a step further too, Angela, a lot of times when you see those different you know, emails, whether they're phishing or real, they'll always have that job rec number. So to Seal's point, if you go onto their website and you know you're on the company website because you went there directly, when you go to that job search, you can always plug that in. That way you don't feel like you're going down a rabbit hole and we'll tell you very quickly whether or not that job posting, and maybe maybe if we take it a step too far saying real or not real, because it might not even be posted, but like that would be another way to add another layer of vetting to it um, right. once you're on that company website so you don't have to go back and forth. That's a good point. I, I think that's probably the most defined. And let's be honest, we're all going to be over the next year learning more and more about these chatbots and what they yes. cannot do. Um, so I'm not going to tell you that I have the definitive answer. Caitlin would probably say the same thing right now because this technology is really kind of blowing up right now and it's a little scary. Yeah. So I do yeah. think, Angela, to your point, personally, I tend to turn off the bots and try to do everything on my own rather than going through the bots. Because okay. we do get a little bit intrusive. It's a bit wild west right now. They're asking for too. Sorry. Yeah. I talked over you, Angela. 
No, no, no. I, I, I get it. It's, it's wild west right now. It is. It really is. Um, and we're going to see how that works out. <laughs> I think you said it best though, Seal, right? Trust your gut. If it feels fishy, run. Moving on, you know? <laughs> Don't walk, run. <laughs> you know, it's funny. Um, the university has introduced some uh, software that they're using for the security. And I was saying to somebody just yesterday, because people will complain about having to do these little security checks. And they really do keep them to about five minutes. I said, you know, I wish I didn't feel this way, but I feel like it's a great reminder because these things are just popping up all the time and they're changing their tactics. And mm -hmm. just to keep me a little bit on my toes, they also tell you they they will send out some phishing things themselves. And if you fall for it, then they tell you, you know, that yeah, that was us. Yeah. You need to yeah. go back and do this one over again. <laughs> that once. And you know, it was a good lesson for me. It just happened mm -hmm. that I had just asked my boss about our evaluation system. And they sent me an email saying, we have a new um, evaluation system. Click here to learn more about it. Mm -hmm. Right. So I fell for it. It wasn't, you know, I never looked at the web address and it was not from an internal source. And for me, like the first thing that I look at whenever, because I receive a lot of emails uh, at work and it's so important to be able to go through them. So some companies do have this policy where they put like, oh, be careful, this is from an external sender. Um, but that for me personally, we don't do that uh, at the company because I would say like 85% of my emails are from external senders. So that wouldn't really help. But I find that telltale sign right away for me for any kind of scam, whether it's regarding a job or just something, you know, where they're asking for your bank account is right away, just look at the email address. And oftentimes you'll see they'll do a spoof of an email address. They'll do like, let's say at uh, FedEx dot something else dot. And like, it's that tiny thing, but that's what makes a difference. So I find email address like yeah yeah that's yeah. doing a good vetting Angela did you have yeah. another question or comment no that's it thank you very much okay so I also wanted to mention there are people who will still reach out directly to employers um, some will try to go in person some will try to do it through social media um, I will tell you that this does not have the greatest success rate but for some people they have tried it and it's worked Larger employers are not going to let you on their site without an appointment. Their security teams, sometimes you can't even get through the gates, much less you can't get through the door. So I do not recommend that you try it with large scale employers. They're probably not going to make, it's probably not going to work. Small to medium size, if you want to try going in person, you can do that. Just keep in mind that if you get to hand in your resume, that was a win. Even if you don't get an interview on site, if you just got to turn in your resume, that was a win. And for some people, they just feel like they present themselves much better in person than they do um, through paper, and they want to try it. If you want to try that, it, it's okay. I do think we're seeing more people today try to identify people who are in hiring roles on social media and reaching out to them. The reality is, in this day and age, if there's not an open position, it's really hard to get into the system. You have to have an exact job title because most employers today are using applicant tracking systems. Um, and applicant tracking systems initially started because the government required reporting on who you, who you how, your applicant pool basically, but they're now used to also call down to the right people that they're looking for. And that's why I say you gotta get through two AIs, applicant tracking systems, use artificial intelligence to rule that, that group down. So you may not find this particular source all that productive, but I still include it because there are some people who still try it and you can go from there. Caitlin, do you guys ever have people try and walk in and talk to you guys? So I would say in the last two to three years, given the way of the world, not so much. Um, but prior to, yes, we would. Um, and that was when we had a fully staffed office and people up front, you know, that, that we could handle the walk-in volume. Um, but with the way that the world has changed in the last few years, uh, not so much. If anything, if people call and say that they prefer to come in versus doing something virtually, we'll certainly accommodate it. But a majority of the time, it's it's not just the walk-ins. And keep in mind, I would even say that for some of the employers, this goes back to after 9-11 when security procedures started, changed in a lot of places. Okay, mm -hmm. um, And it's just so even if things relent after a little bit of time, hopefully when we're considered to no longer be in the pandemic, it may never go back to the idea before. I don't think it will because I think the workplace has changed. 
Mm -hmm. I would agree. All right. So the next thing I like to talk about, and I know we are going over time, I apologize, um, is career and job fairs. You know, there are virtual job fairs, which in many cases kind of come across more as an information session, unless you get a one-on-one -on -one time with somebody. If they're doing it as a group, it feels a little bit more like an information session, but it's a contact with an employer. If you are looking at a virtual job fair, note that you will almost always have to register in advance because they're going to kind of give you a time, a scheduled time with the, each employer and indicate which employers that you plan to, you'd like to reach out to. And then they kind of grant you the time with them. Um, you do want to research the employers prior to the event so you can make the most of your time with them. Some of these virtual job fairs are over uh, multiple days. Others are two hours and that's it. So, um, you know, they're, they're kind of a little bit of the wild west with the virtual job fairs. The technology at least is getting better when they first started doing these. Oftentimes, you know, even talking to some of the recruiters, they just were not the most worthwhile events for them. Um, because they didn't feel like they got to know people. But I still think any contact you can get with an employer is a contact you didn't have at the start of the day. Mm -hmm. So I do recommend that you do them. If it's an individual, it's probably more of a screening interview. And then you would tend to have a larger scale um, interview uh, with more people from the organization, either in person or another online. These days, some processes are completely virtual. Other pro I mean, when I was hired for Thomas Edison, um, I never stepped foot on the campus until after I went to my first day of um, work. In-person job fairs are probably things that most of us are a little bit more familiar with. And a couple of things that I would say is remember that they're not just job hunting events, they're also networking events too. So even if somebody doesn't have a job that you're looking for right now, if it's an employer that you would like to get to know more about, it's a good idea to go and introduce yourself there as well. Um, but when you are applying to a job, Keep in going for um, going to a job fair to apply for jobs, I should say. Keep in mind that you want to have a resume that you can kind of pull out pretty easily for the employer that you're looking for, and there may be a lot of variety there. So what I usually recommend is that you have a well-organized system where you may have some targeted resumes and one general resume that you can give to the employers that maybe have something you didn't expect but really find interesting. Manage your time well. First, you are going to need an elevator pitch. And I think your elevator pitch is really how you're going to introduce yourself. It is really important to practice what you're going to say um, in that you don't want to get up there and go, what, you know, hi, I'm so-and-so. Um, can you tell me more about your organization? That's not an elevator pitch. An elevator pitch is you introducing yourself and explaining a little bit about your background, why you're interested in them and then giving them the opportunity to talk to you a little bit about what's going on in their process. Usually we call them elevator pitches because it's in theory about the time it would take you to ride from the first to the um, top floor on an elevator. Keeping in mind that in a taller building, the elevators move faster and in a smaller building, they tend to move slower. So, um, so it's about less than a minute, um, 45 seconds, which doesn't sound like a lot of time until if you've ever tried to record yourself, 45 seconds sounds like forever when you're the person doing the, the introduction. Um, I would say too, Seal, on the, on the elevator pitches, it's so important to your point to practice and know what you're going to say, but I would also err on the side of caution to not come in too rehearsed because you never know what the person on the other end of the conversation is going to be looking for or how that intro might happen. So, you know, I think it's always great, even if you jot down, you know, your top three to five, you know, hot takes and bullets, but, you know, you're not reading off of a card, but make sure that they are fresh, right? Because you never know how those interactions are going to go. And what do they say, right? First impressions go a long way. So, you know, just to keep in mind, I think practicing is key, um, but not to the point that you're reading off of a script either. And just a small point, because I totally agree with Caitlin, this is, Oftentimes I'm asked, what about shaking hands these days? Should I be shaking hands? Shouldn't I be shaking hands? The reality is if you go up to the employer and they are, are extending their hands and you're open to shaking hands, shake their hand. But if they have not put their hand out, I would probably do the nod at this point. I think the nod is considered to be more of an acceptable thing. And I don't know that we're ever going to fully go back to the shaking hands. Yeah. However, if you are shaking hands, it's thumb to thumb, no fishy handshakes, okay? <laughs> I'm not saying fishy handshakes. Um, so, and that's why I mean this. So you want to have that good and a nice firm, but not crushing handshake, okay? Guys, 
don't worry too with females. We want a firm handshake too. We just don't want you to crush our hands. But I know that seems like a, a weird point, but I think these are the things that when we get on site, we're worried about. Should I shake hands? Shouldn't I shake hands? Yeah, it's a great point. And just kind of take their lead. Keep in mind, if it's a really busy job fair, they may not want to shake hands because they're going to be touching 85 million and you may not want to shake their hand. Mm -hmm. Bring hand sanitizer or most of them today will have some hand sanitizer on the table. Don't hesitate to use it. Even in an in-person job fair, if you have the list of employers in advance, I think you want to spend a little time and research them. It's going to allow you to know who you want to spend time with. You know, you're not going to necessarily be able to visit every employer there. So mm -hmm. who are your targets? And then manage your time well, because oftentimes the most popular employers get long lines. And what I see is people come in and they're like, oh, there's Johnson & Johnson. Let me get on their line. Well, the reality is my experience has been, and I've run a number of job fairs over the years, is I call there's a domino effect. What's going to happen is anywhere from an hour to two hours before the job fair is supposed to end, one employer will close up. Maybe they had some other obligation and had to leave early. It may have nothing to do with how successful that job fair is going for them. They just have to leave. It starts that that is the first domino to fall. And the person next to them, if they're not real busy at the time, will start to close up. And the next thing you know, everybody else is leaving. Well, the people with the lines will stay to see through their lines, at least to the end of the time they were supposed to be there. But the people without lines are going to leave. So if you get online with a large employer, it may be that all the smaller or medium-sized firms that you were interested in leave before you get, get through the large employer's line. But if you see the small and medium-sized firms first and then get in line, they will typically see their line out. I have a question. Yes. Hi. Um, where, where can you find uh, a good resource to find these virtual and in-person job fairs? So believe it or not, I do Google searches of job fairs in my area. And you'd be surprised what you come up with. I also think check out colleges, especially public colleges, because many of them will open their job fairs to the public. Um, community colleges in particular will open their job fairs to the public. Mm -hmm. um, some of the four-year publics will have certain fairs for the year that they open to the public and others that are only for their own students. Right now, we are not doing any job fairs. We're still kind of, um, we did not have a career development office until I joined the university a little over a year ago. So we're still kind of building both our employer and our student base so that when we do run one, we can run more. <laughs> but I do so think we'll the, find that. Oops, sorry. Does the career one stop, I know we were talking about that earlier. Do they still do job fairs too? I feel like that was one that I've seen as well. They and they always job, get listed. Yeah, they do have a job fair site um, that okay. they're connected with as well. Got it. Okay. Sometimes it's been more active, I think, than others when I've right. worked. Um, and then you will find when you do that Google search, there's um, a couple companies that run them across the country. Mm -hmm. um, and I try and put those also in the career events side of, uh, site of the career development um, website. So if you go on my website in the lower right hand corner, there's an events calendar. And I try to find any job fairs I can and put them in there. So you can start there and then look beyond that. Now, I put this into the career um, and job fairs, but I... I'm going to um, broaden this to pretty much your entire job search, job search. Send thank you notes. My theory is anybody who spends more than five minutes with you in your job hunt, you should send them a quick note. Now, people over the years have said to me, should they be handwritten? Should they be email? My personal preference is an emailed note. I think timeliness is more important than it being handwritten. Plus, if you don't have good handwriting, sending me a thank you note that I can't read <laughs> doesn't help you all that much, okay? Um, but if you are gonna handwrite it, that's okay too. Just get it out as quick as, quickly as possible. My personal experience has been that when I meet with a candidate, whether it's at a job fair or whether it's in um, for an interview, and by the end of the day, they sent me a thank you note, I'm like, they're really interested. Whereas, that's something else you could tie into the LinkedIn connections as well, including your thank you in that note, make yes. the connection and send a quick little thank you there as well. Yes. And even if you've been working with, um, you know, the, the admin for somebody and they've been particularly helpful, send them a thank you note. Sometimes we forget the, those little touches. But let me tell you, I know when I was running a larger office, if my secretary said that a candidate had not treated her well, I wasn't hiring them. Mm -hmm. if, if my admin had said to me, this person really, I, I was impressed with them. 
that carried a lot of weight with me because they got to work with these people and I got to, I don't want conflicts in my workplace. Yeah. So I was just going to say that I think basically you can never go wrong with a thank you. You know, everyone always wants to feel appreciated and gratitude goes a long way in any case. Yes. And keep in mind, these thank you notes don't need to be more than two or three lines long. You're just going to thank them for their time, maybe reference exactly. something that was said, or if you forgot to bring up something, this is your opportunity to say it yeah. and close it up. That's it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think it also really reestablishes the initial connection that you just made, which is important too. Absolutely. Keep in mind, um, I used to run a lot of education, not career fairs, but these actual interview days. And I was talking with one of the recruiters because there are a lot of job fairs that they attended and they said they preferred the atmosphere we had because when they went to these job fairs, they'd walk out with a stack of 400 resumes and they just look at this thing going, how am I ever gonna get through these things? So sending that thank you note and reminding them who you are because by the end of the day, they may not remember. Mm It's just a good touch. All right, and then third-party recruiters. And I think sometimes people underestimate the power of a third-party recruiter. There are different types and different levels depending upon um, what it is you're looking for. So we have executive search firms are usually people who are looking for senior level staff, CEOs, CFOs. I actually have a brother who um, he uh, has and a partner have a firm that they run and they only do CEO level positions. So if you're not there yet, you're probably not gonna be dealing with them. You have contract staffing companies, which I think are actually um, becoming more popular again. Um, So with a contract staffing, what it is is an employer may hire a contract staffing um, organization to fill their needs. Oftentimes in IT, you see this happen. Um, I had a, a cousin who, He worked for J.P. Morgan Chase um, for 15 years, but under over those 15 years, he was sometimes with J.P. Morgan Chase, sometimes through a contracting agency, back to J.P. Morgan Chase, back to a different staffing agency. So, you know, sometimes from an employer's perspective, this whole idea of am I outsourcing or am I going to manage them myself? um, They go back and forth on those things. Don't underestimate them. Also, sometimes a contracting staffing agency is kind of your test. If you go with the contract staffing agency and they like your work, then they may hire you outright at the end of the contract. Um, I Everything that you touched on, I would mirror and scream it from the rooftops. I think that there sometimes comes this stigma when people look at contracts or temp opportunities. Um, but it really does open up so many doors. And I think, you know, you had mentioned it, but I always call those contract opportunities the longest interviews ever, but not only on the client side, as far as them seeing if you're the right fit for the company, but for then you yourself also, is it an industry you've never been in before? Are they challenging you in ways that you, you know, are open to in your job search? So it's definitely a two-way street in that sense. Um, And if you're somebody that's in a position that maybe hasn't interviewed in years, Um, working with a contract team is a great way to kind of test the waters and dip your toes back in, um, you know, to get out there and meet multiple companies and clients in the area that might be hiring. So I don't think that there is any harm in having a conversation and there's no, there's no obligation. So if you sign up with a contract agency and you're with them for a month and you never accept an assignment and find something on your own, they're going to be the first ones to cheer you on. You know, or on the flip side, if it helps you to fill a gap while you're looking for something permanent, you know, there's there's so many different routes that you can take it. But I, I honestly, I spent the first six years with Robert Half on the contract side, and I can't sing the praises enough. I think it is an, an underutilized resource for people in their job search. Alyssa, you had a question. Well, yeah, sorry, no, I just wanted to add that it can hurt. You know, like if someone's kind of on the fence about it and they're figuring out whether or not they want to, like it just can't hurt. It's another resource that's available to you. Like, why not try to make use of that? Absolutely. You're right. A conversation never hurts. That's for sure. Exactly. (laughs) Yeah. You know, and again, my theme throughout this has been going through at least the initial stages of exploring an opportunity is never a bad thing. You will either learn that it's not what you want or that you're on the right track. Um, And then placement agencies and staffing firms, and even within placement agencies and staffing firms, there's a whole range of levels within them. Um, I'm going to actually let Caitlin talk a little bit more about this because she definitely knows more about this side than I do. So I'm going to take the lead on that one. 
Surely. Um, so, and keep in mind, I can only speak to my experience with Robert Half. Um, there is plenty of firms in the local area. Um, Robert Half itself, you know, we are a global company with multiple lines of business. So, you know, I would like to say that we are, you know, the top tier, but I, I just, I say that because different firms are going to operate differently. And so. I would interject here and say, I would agree with that categorization. Thank so you. Not just, I think, Caitlin, proud yeah. of her employer. I think it is actually the reputation of the firm um, yeah. nationally and internationally. Oh, thank you for saying that. Cause you know, we've, we've been in business almost 80 years now, you know, when what started out as the accounting and finance world has gone into so many different specializations, whether it's marketing and creative or technology. Um, we are at the end of the day, matchmakers in the job search, right? So I think that's the best way to look at it is more of a partnership. Now, listen, are there firms out there that might be transactional? Possibly. And I'm not knocking them. Everybody has their own way of doing it. But I think the mindset is that you want to find a recruiter in a company that's going to represent you in the best light, right? Because we might be working with clients that are looking to hire, whether it's a confidential role or just somebody that we've known for years and years. And Seal touched on it earlier, right? If you're applying and submitting resumes, they're getting jumbled in with everybody from all the other career sites that are sending them in, where if you're working with a recruiter directly, we're able to advocate for you. We're able to maybe ask some of those tougher questions and share that feedback with you and take more than just the skills and things that you've learned over the years, but also what's important to you. You know, we're living in a world right now where work-life balance is the number one thing that people are talking about. But on the flip side, you know, what are companies offering? So I think it really just looking at the different firms as that middle person and that matchmaker in your job search versus a transactional help me find a job. You know, and I'll even take it a step further that recruiters, especially somebody, you know, like myself and my team locally, we like to be a resource for you in multiple ways. So it might not necessarily be the first job, the first interview that we send you out on, but Hey, Caitlin, what's going on in the market? What types of jobs are you seeing? You know, we get so many people that call in and ask questions about remote opportunities. Listen, we would all love to work remote if we could all day, every day, right? But the market has changed so much from where it was two years ago. So we're not seeing that necessarily as frequently. And if we are, what does that look like? Um, so really, it's just, it's another avenue. It's another door. It's the eyes and ears for you. You know, we all have lives and things that are going on. So if you can have somebody in your corner helping you to get to that end goal, you know, and same thing as I mentioned with the contract side too, there's no obligation. So if you find a job on your own, it doesn't mean that we can't keep in touch, you know, five, 10 years down the road as your career is growing as well. So I think it's important to find that person, that recruiter and that company that represents you in the best light and that you find that true partnership with, and then really building it out from there. I hate to bring it back full circle, but like it all started with us talking about networking. That's what recruiters are here to do, to be part of your network and help you expand on that. So, you know, Alyssa said it, a conversation never hurt. So, And let me ask you, Caitlin, so if somebody wanted to explore opportunities through Robert Half, do they have to have a particular opportunity to kind of open that gateway or can they reach out to you without a particular opportunity? In mind? No, they can reach out without any opportunity. So I will say that um, Robert Half as a whole does post all of our jobs on our website. Um, we might not necessarily reference the company's name. And again, that could be for a multitude of reasons, but any jobs that we post are real. Um, so certainly if you poke around on there and you see something you're interested in, but in order to, for lack of a better phrase, register with a recruiter at Robert Half, you don't necessarily need a job to get a foot in the door. It's as simple as opening up the door taking 15, 20 minutes out of your day to meet with a recruiter and talk about your experience and what you're looking for in an opportunity. And then they take it from there, you know? So it's, the beautiful thing is too, once you have that initial conversation, if you do see opportunities on our site that you're interested in, then you can kind of loop it back around to say, hey, Caitlin saw this, what do you think? Um, so it just puts you a little step ahead. Um, but no, to answer your question, you don't necessarily have to connect initially over a particular position or opportunity. It can simply be a conversation. And two things I would say is one, you're working with the third party. You're not turning your job search over to a third party. Mm -hmm. You want to continue to look for yourself, you know. Um, but also you do, if you are working with the third party, you want to be open and honest with them. It can be really awkward if you're applying for the same job they're putting you forward with because you didn't tell them. 
Okay. Right. Then you kind of look like what's going on here. Mm -hmm. um, and that can also lose your trust with the third party too. So you might lose it with the employer and the third party agency as well. So mm -hmm. just always be honest. You know, people understand that you're applying for jobs on your own. Mm -hmm. You just need to know. <laughs> right. And it doesn't mean that they can't advocate for you as right. one of their clients, even though you sent it in yourself too, correct? Right. Yeah, absolutely. And I would say even on the flip side, just to when you talk about the transparency piece, right, I think it goes both ways. You know, a lot of the times we'll have people come to us and they'll say, oh, I applied to 15, 20 jobs, you know, in the last few weeks, why haven't I received a phone call? Well, just like we're talking to you about your expectations and what you're looking for in a particular job, we're also getting that feedback from a client as well, as far as we need these things and being able to match it too. So, you know, a lot of the times I think people might get turned off if recruiters are a little bit too transparent, but I think also having the mindset that it's to help you at the end of the day, because the last thing we want to do is send you to a job and set you up for failure also. So, you know, keep in mind that transparency just goes both ways too. At the end of the day, we all have the same goal. You know, it's just sometimes those tough conversations are never fun for anybody, but at the end of the day, it is to kind of get you to the end goal. And one of the things I've found too with third parties is say Caitlin was to refer you, you, you worked with Caitlin and she referred you out to a position and you didn't get it. She may get some feedback that you wouldn't get directly and be able to give you some of that feedback so that you can make adjustments in how you present yourself moving forward. Absolutely. I just want to kind of go over, I'm going to give you some final tips, ask Caitlin to give any final tips she has. Um, the first thing that I always suggest is use any and all means available to you. You know, I think sometimes we get hung up on what is the most effective job search tool. Well, the reality is you only need one right job. I think you use everything and then you kind of adjust your time as to what is proving to be the most lucrative for you. But it doesn't mean that you say, okay, I would never submit my resume without there being an actual job um, when we were talking about the direct contact or I will never use an, a third party site because they can lead you um, to opportunities they can also like a third party site in terms of the uh, big job boards but also when you then go to the employer site maybe you see some things on there that they never posted to a, a, a big job board that are just as interesting to you so using all of these methods and kind of adjusting your time is really probably your best bet i also recommend that you keep a log of all your activity because trust me, it will get confusing. One of the things I personally have done when I've done job searches is I start a folder for every, I have a job search folder, and then I start a folder for every employer that I'm working with, and I keep the job posting, if there was, was one. I um, put the resume and cover letter that I sent them. I write any notes, if I've formed questions for them, my research, all in one folder, so I have one place to go to to find it all. Um, if I write questions for my interview, any of that stuff, I, I know where I can refer back to it. If, you know, sometimes the other thing that I think job hunters don't realize is these processes can take forever. Higher ed in particular, I find is really bad about this. You know, I had a, a, a position once where I had applied and I got a call that they wanted to interview me. And the person said, we need to move very quickly. And I was like, okay, figuring, okay, job interview next week. We're going to probably by July, this will be done. This was in June. Um, they said, we're going to call you in three weeks to schedule an interview. And I'm like, that's not freaking my world at all. And it was three weeks before they scheduled the interview, which was another three weeks. Then the second interview, they waited three weeks to call to schedule that. So the job that was posted in May and had such a quick time turnaround, I didn't start until October. So just keep in mind, and some of that can be that's the industry, that things happen very slowly. If any of you are looking in the government, government is notoriously slow mm -hmm. until they're not. And then all of a sudden they may get a small window to, you know, to do something and they move like gangbusters. Don't predict. And I can almost honestly tell you in certain fields about the time you sit there and go, I didn't get the job. There's just no chance. They, they, I just didn't even get a call back. I was just working with somebody yesterday who then called me the next day and said, I know I told you none of those things worked out. She said, I have an interview now in two weeks. Yeah. You know, so about the time you think this can't possibly be active anymore, it may come back at you. So having an organized way to find what that job was and how you're going to move forward is really a good tactic. 
It also will give you points. If you've set up a log, you might want to include when do you want to follow up with somebody. Um, if it was through a networking contact, write notes for yourself so that you can follow up with that person. Yeah, sorry. No, I just wanted to make a comment that it's almost like a full-time job to get a job. <laughs> that's what you have to do with the tracking, you know? It really um, is. And that's where yeah. my last point was going to be set goals for yourself and hold yourself accountable. I've said to current students, think of it as an extra course. And however much time you would spend per week on your course is what you're going to spend on your job search and almost schedule time into your day. Have flexibility when you start interviewing because you want to respond to what the employer's openings are. But you need to keep yourself on course. And just remember, you know, my first internship, you know, my internship, I, my internship supervisor had on her wall an eight by 11 piece of paper that had the word no all across it until the very final word in the very bottom right hand corner was the word yes. The reality is job searching, you are going to face some rejection. You're not going to hear back from everybody. I think that is one of the most frustrating things I hear from people is I applied and never heard. It happens all the time. I have actually at times gotten something two years later where they were cleaning out their system and sent, you didn't get the job. I was like, I figured that out. <laughs> These processes are not perfect. Oftentimes, employers will not close out a job and send you a rejection letter even until the person has accepted and started the position. Don't get upset. There are so many reasons. Sometimes when things even are posted, they already have a person in mind. And legally, some, you know, employer, I know I worked for an employer who was insistent that we had to do a competitive search for every position, even if we kind of knew who we were going to hire. And I'm sitting there going, it's not a competitive search and it's not fair but it's the policy. So don't take it as a personal um, evaluation of your candidacy if you don't get an interview or you don't get a job. I was working with somebody who um, the employer called them and said, we can interview you at this time and this day. And they said, I'm really interested in the position, but that is the one day I cannot do. I have an, a program for my employer that I can't miss. I am the person running it. They said, well, then we're going to just take you off the list. And she was so angry. And I said, they already had somebody in mind. If they really were interested in you, they'd have figured out a way to be a little bit more flexible than giving you one date and time. So just keep in mind, it's not personal, yet it feels very personal, okay? It's one of my favorite lines now. It's not personal to them, but it may be very personal to you. And just remember, they don't mean it personally. Mm -hmm. Caitlin, any suggestions and comments kind of closing us out? Honestly, I think you took the words right out of my mouth. You know, I would say just to, to kind of follow up to that, especially now, you know, if any of you are in the job market, it's a tough time, you know, in, in all my years doing what I'm doing and, and even some of my partners who have been with this company for 25 plus years, it's a very competitive market. So to just kind of mirror what Seal said, you know, don't get discouraged. If you need to take a beat and, and take a breath and start fresh tomorrow, then do it, Right. You know, you all have something that you can bring to a company, to a team. It's just a matter of figuring out who that person is, right? So use your resources, always be networking. And when I say that, I don't mean you have to go to all the events, but anytime you're talking to somebody or meet somebody new, you really, really never know. So, you know, I just, I would say, take it a day at a time, right? At the end of the day, this is your search and the efforts you put in, you will get out of it. So don't be discouraged. Um, always keep that that mentality going of what the end goal is, you know, that we were talking about and what you want to get out of your search. Um, and you'll get there. You know, I think this has been great for me too. So I appreciate the invite to join today. It's been awesome meeting everybody, you know, and um, but this has been fun and informative for me as well. So thank you. <laughs> I always enjoy our time together, but I think this has been a great conversation tonight. Thank you again. I appreciate your persistence. Just remember that persistence will come in handy throughout your search. <laughs> From Thomas Edison State University, this is Edison Soundstage.